There's a giant ghostly hand that stretches across space. Its eerie fingers are reaching for a glowing red cloud that looks like molten space lava. Although it looks like a scene straight out of a sci-fi movie, it's 100% real. The hand was formed after an enormous star collapsed in a huge supernova explosion. The boom created a new star that is bursting with energy. The energy given off by the star is so big that it caused debris from the explosion to swirl around it. This is what created the supernatural-looking hand. The hand is so big that it stretches a colossal 150 light years. As for the lava-like structure it's reaching for, that's actually a huge gas cloud. So while it looks spooky, it's completely harmless. And you can go to sleep tonight without worrying about a giant ghostly space hand scooping you out of bed. There's a bizarre star hidden in the depths of space that seems to randomly flash on and off. It's known as Tabby's star, and its light dims at super irregular intervals for really odd lengths of time. There have been so many theories about what's causing this, from meteor showers to outer space interference. The comet shower idea was quickly debunked. Dust from comets, which would block the light, goes away after a couple of months. Tabby's star fades slowly over decades, so the timing just doesn't add up. It can't be down to planets either, as no planet is big enough to block that much light from a star. After years of speculation, scientists have finally found an explanation for the strange phenomenon. The dimming and brightening are actually a result of space dust. A ring of dust surrounds the star, which often temporarily blocks its light. On day 8 of its mission in 2019, China's lunar rover discovered something really strange on the far side of our moon that caught the attention of the entire world. While navigating a path around a bunch of lunar craters, it spotted something really weird lurking inside one of the moon's holes. It was a colored substance, just like gel, that we'd never encountered before. The curious material was a rich dark green color and glistened like diamonds. After a year of analyzing the foreign substance that measured 20 inches by 6 inches, the scientists finally came to a conclusion. The glistening effect seems to come from glass. In space, it usually appears as a result of lunar impact melts. This means that it's most likely from a comet or rock that has hit the moon and melted upon impact. But while it's likely that the strange substance is just melted rock, scientists aren't 100% sure. This is because the pictures were captured under bad lighting conditions, and there were a bunch of other factors that badly impacted the quality of the images. So, the jury is still out on this one. There's a huge space cucumber floating through the galaxy, and no one really knows where it came from or why it's there. Okay, it's not exactly a cucumber. Or a pickle. It's more likely a super-elongated rock. Scientists think it may be longer than half a mile, but only 540 feet wide. It's traveling so quickly that there's no way it's bound by our sun's gravity, meaning that the strange object was formed somewhere outside of our solar system. We don't even know how long it's been wandering through space. It's estimated that it entered our solar system during the Victorian era, but who knows where it had traveled before then. For years, we've been told there are eight planets in our solar system. Nine, if you count Pluto, which got kicked out of the club some years ago. But that might all be about to change. There may be an enormous secret world lurking in the midst of our system, which scientists are calling Planet Nine. This undiscovered planet could be way out past Neptune. There are seemingly unexplained clusters of orbits there, and this hidden ninth planet would explain this. The planet, if it exists, would be 10 times the size of Earth take at least 10,000 years to orbit the Sun, and would sit over 200 times further out than our home planet. This is why it's been so tricky to identify, as it's almost impossible to take a picture of. In 2019, 30% of the area that the planet is likely to be in had been searched. It will take at least another two years to cover the remaining area. In the meantime, we'll be waiting on the edge of our seats. Mm, no. Strange radio waves are beaming down on Earth, and scientists are baffled. These fast radio bursts are sudden, unexplained, and last just milliseconds. We first picked up the weird signals in 2007, and scientists have been scratching their heads ever since. They appear to be coming from outside the Milky Way, millions of light-years away. 
For us to pick them up from that far away, they must be emitting more energy in a fraction of a second than the sun does in 80 years. Most of these signals only came once, which would have made identifying them much easier, until this all changed in 2017. In August, a signal was picked up that repeated 93 times, ruling out speculation that the signals were being caused by random one-off events. To this day, we still don't know what's causing the signals. Back in 2014, NASA captured a surprising picture of the sun that showed that it might like to play dress-up. A brilliant storm of magnetic fields caused the sun to look like a flaming jack-o'-lantern. Even weirder is that the image was captured on October 8th. It was possible because of something called active regions. These are basically areas of the sun that have greater levels of light and energy. This is what gives the flaming look in the images. The light forms two eyes, a nose, and a wide, jagged, smiling mouth. Fortunately, this look was just a coincidence, and there isn't a giant pumpkin-carving enthusiast lurking in the depths of space. Hey, I want to know, is this a trick or treat? Space fans spotted what appeared to look like a spoon on the surface of Mars. It was half-covered in dust. They noticed it after images from a Mars rover had been released. As spooky as the suspicious silverware may sound, it was just a trick of the light. The spoon is just a regular old rock, albeit in a slightly odd shape. The play of shadows in the photo made the object look even more spoon-like. Maybe there's a dish nearby that the spoon ran away with. A cosmic eyeball floating somewhere among the stars is no regular-sized eye. It measures an incredible 660 miles across. One of Saturn's moons, Tethys, has become a bit of a celeb to space fans. The spherical moon sports a large crater that makes it look exactly like a giant interplanetary eyeball. There's even a set of peaks inside the crater that look like an iris. Saturn has a gang of 60 moons in total, and Tethys isn't the only one that looks like a random Earth object. Prometheus looks like a potato, Atlas resembles a pita bread freshly served from a Greek restaurant, and Mimas even looks like some villain spacecraft. And then there's this. There's a giant cat's eye right in the middle of space. Its official name is NGC 6543, but that's kind of long and boring, so most people call it the Cat's Eye Nebula. And it's actually one of the first nebulas to have ever been discovered. Like other nebulas, it was formed by a star that shed its outer layer of gas. The gas floated off and produced this amazing and intriguing structure. The star fires off this layer of gas every 1,500 years. Each time it does this, it creates a spectacular new dust shell. Hey, don't get me started on gas. The Moon, a beautiful, natural satellite with some mysterious dark splotches. We always see only one side of it, so we're used to this image. It's hard to imagine the Moon looking any other way. But it used to be different. Oh ho ho, it used to be so different. Picture this. A huge incandescent satellite in the sky that is causing constant tsunamis. I suggest we go very far into the past to see what the moon was like many, many years ago. The moon formed around 4.5 billion years ago. At that time, our green-blue planet was still a red-hot, insanely unstable piece of rock flying in space. We didn't have the moon yet. And a day on our planet only lasted six hours, which meant only three hours of daylight. Volcanoes erupted all over the place, releasing poisonous gas into the air, and a bunch of meteorites regularly crashed into the planet. At the same time, 4.5 billion years ago, the so-called Big Splash occurred, or as scientists call it, the Giant Impact Hypothesis. It claims that once an object the size of Mars crashed into Earth, Mars is about two times as small as our planet, so the blow wasn't too bad, but it was quite catastrophic. This powerful impact tore off part of the outer layers of that Mars-sized object and Earth. The very core of this space body merged with Earth's own dense core, and a huge number of fragments of Earth flew into outer space. So, this was the beginning of our moon, or, saying in a scientific way, the process of differentiation has begun. This is the process all planetary bodies go through at the beginning of their lives. Since the impact was very hot, 
Its heat carried away most of the gases and liquids from the broken pieces of Earth. Only a relatively dry stone surface remained. So yeah, there is water and gases on the moon, but in very small quantities. The gravity of our planet was strong enough to make all these hot stone fragments stay in its orbit, and they gradually began to stick together. The chemicals they contained were distributed in layers. Iron, which was heavier, sank deeper inside, and lighter elements formed the surface. In a short time, a hundred years or less, the ring of steam, dust, and molten rock fused together. The largest clusters with the strongest gravity attracted more and more particles, gradually forming the moon. It looked like a red-hot bubble ball. Sadly, the nucleus of this newborn moon turned out to be very small. It lacked iron and other heavy elements to form into something substantial, like a planet. The oldest rocks of the moon probably formed in the ocean of magma. And when the moon gradually cooled down, it turned out to be a white, clean, and perfectly even ball. But it was still completely different from what we have now. To begin with, immediately after its birth, the satellite was located at a distance of only 13,500 miles away from Earth. This is 15 times closer than it is now, around 238,000 miles. It's scary to imagine how huge and bright the moon looked in the sky at that moment. The view was probably both beautiful and terrifying. And, of course, such proximity caused incredibly huge waves on Earth. The planet experienced regular tsunamis. Also, at that time, the moon was spinning very fast, and it wasn't turned to Earth with only one side. But, in general, Earth and the Moon had a positive impact on each other. For example, it was the Moon that made our day last 24 hours. Now, Earth's axis is mostly tilted 23.5 degrees from the plane of its orbit around the Sun. Without the Moon, Earth rotated rapidly. But thanks to the satellite, the planet's tilt stabilized, which led to a wide and pleasant variety of climates on Earth. To be fair, the gravity of our planet also helped the Moon. Thanks to it, the moon began to rotate more and more slowly while gradually moving away from us. Over the years, its orbit has moved far away from our planet. At the same time, the moon became tidally locked to Earth. This means that its rotation period coincides with its orbital period. Or, in other words, the moon moves around itself as fast as it moves around the Earth. That's why the moon always faces our planet with only one side. When the moon moved away, tides on Earth became calmer. Now, water could flow to the most remote corners of our planet. It was then that life appeared on Earth. But back to the evolution of the moon itself. What was happening on its surface after its formation? The next stages of the moon's development were childhood and adolescence. And as is usually the case at this stage, this period was insane. No wonder! About 4 billion years ago, the solar system was going crazy. During the first 600 million years of the Moon's existence, large asteroids and comets constantly collided with it. Now, they were bothering not only our Earth, but also its satellite. These impacts were the most powerful in the history of the Moon. They left many large craters, which were later filled with dark rock. So, Earth wasn't enough for you, huh, space? Once, a dwarf planet crashed into the moon. It was about the size of Ceres, the largest object in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. This explosion formed the SPA basin and also forever changed the appearance of the moon. Can you see that dark spot on the far side of the moon? Right there in this very south? This spot is called the South Pole Aitken Basin. Its diameter is about 1,600 miles. And yes, it was formed by the impact I've mentioned about 4.3 billion years ago. This planet brought with it a bunch of complex and strange chemical compounds that scientists are now finding all over the far surface of the Moon. These compounds began to emit a lot of heat, melted part of the lunar mantle, and, oops, accidentally woke up volcanoes. The volcanoes began to erupt furiously a huge amount of magma was distributed over the surface of the moon. Many years later, it cooled down, leaving behind those famous dark splotches that we're so used to. They're called the Lunar Maria. 
there are much fewer craters there than on the lunar highlands. But for the last billion years, the moon has been geologically inactive, except for occasional collisions with meteorites. In general, the appearance of the moon changed forever as a result of these events, and, battered and tired, it entered adulthood. But even then, it couldn't get any peace. A bunch of meteorites decided to bother it again. Honestly, it wasn't that bad. There were many collisions, but all of them were quite small. They just left a bunch of craters and pits on the moon and maybe damaged its mantle a little. Some of the collisions deepened already existing large craters. The moon's crust was getting thinner and thinner over the years because of all the chaos going on. And now we call this upper part of the lunar crust covered with craters the lunar highlands. All those white and bright areas of the moon? The highlands. But in the end, the universe finally calmed down for now at least, and the moon began to look the way it does today. There are still many things we don't know about Earth's natural satellite. There are moments in its history that scientists still can't accurately explain, but they're continuing to study our beautiful satellite. The data about the moon is useful to people not only for its own sake, it gives us a more complete picture of both the history of our solar system and space as a whole. So, let's hope that one day, we'll be able to find out everything there is to know about the moon. The space crew had been getting ready for the launch for over three years. The preparations for landing on the strange planet included gathering and studying rock samples in the Grand Canyon, exploring ancient volcano formations in the Nevada National Security Site, and looking into gas and lava vents, lava lakes, and pit craters in various locations in Hawaii. To be able to resist microgravity conditions, they learned how to walk obliquely by being strapped and suspended sideways and trying to move along walls. They had to test their limits through intensive diet and sleep regimens to make sure they'd be safe in outer space. It took them three days, three hours, and 49 minutes to reach the surface of this new world in a place called the Sea of Tranquility. They could have gone for the Ocean of Storms or the Central Bay, but they chose this place to land because it had good visibility and it was relatively smooth and easily reachable with as little propellant as possible. One of the first things they noticed when they got there was that, well, the place kind of smelled. This may sound like the beginning of a science fiction novel, but it's actually the true story about how the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. Since then, the moon has had 12 human visitors to this day. We think of it as our neighboring space buddy, but there's still much we don't know about this mysterious satellite. And that should come as no surprise, since the moon is actually always showing us the same face. That is because the Earth and its only permanent natural satellite are in synchronous rotation, which makes us think it's always permanently still. The truth is, it's not in a fixed position, and it is actually moving further and further away from the Earth each year by 1.5 inches. Believe it or not, the Earth and the moon although being 238,855 miles apart, deeply influence each other. While the moon is partially responsible for the tides of the seas and oceans on our planet's surface, our Earth is actually to blame for movement on the moon. They're called moonquakes, and they last way longer than earthquakes, some of them up to half an hour. It may look perfectly round to us on a warm summer's night, but the moon is actually oval the lemon-like shape is caused by the Earth's gravitational pull. Our moon features more than footprints when it comes to traces of humans. In 1969, American astronauts left many objects on the surface of our satellite, such as two golf balls, a drawing by famous artist Andy Warhol, and a message from Queen Elizabeth II herself. One of the last people to walk on the moon to this day, an astronaut named Eugene Cernan, scribbled his daughter's initials on the moon's surface in 1972. Since it appears there's no wind or any other type of weather change there, the letters TDC could remain there permanently. It's actually possible to be allergic to the moon. Harrison Jack Schmidt, an astronaut from the Apollo 17 mission, spent some time in a valley in the Sea of Serenity, then climbed back into the crew's lunar module but had some moon dust on him. Just as he removed his spacesuit, he got red eyes, sneezing fits, and other allergic reactions that lasted two hours. Since it's so close to us, 
we've established that the moon has a time zone of its own. We call it the lunar standard time, but it doesn't correspond to time on Earth. To get an equivalent, the explanation is a bit more complex, but in simple terms, a year on the moon is split up into 12 days, each one about as long as a month on Earth. Each one of these days got its name after a different astronaut who has walked on the moon. The start date of this calendar coincides with the moment Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, the lunar year 1, day 1, began on July 21st, 1969 at 2.56.15 Universal Time. Since the moon has a very thin atmosphere, it has some pretty crazy temperatures, both hot and cold. They can go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Over by the moon's poles, however, the temperature is always at around minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Humans have tried to trace the connection between our natural satellite and the Earth for as long as we can remember, coming up with words to explain why the moon's existence influences us so. In the Middle Ages, scientists and philosophers thought that during a full moon, some people were more likely to experience different health conditions. Because they saw this inexplicable connection to the full moon, people with these symptoms were named lunatics, or at times, literally, moonsick. People are not the only creatures living on Earth that are affected by moon cycles. Dog owners are 28% more likely to take their pet to vet emergency rooms during the full moon. You may think that's the reason why wolves have this preference for howling at a full moon, more so in popular culture. But scientists haven't been able to find any connection between wolf behavior and the lunar cycles, so it might as well just be a myth. The largest known crater in our solar system is also found on our moon and is called the South Pole Aitken. This giant formation is located on the far side of the moon and measures 1,550 miles in diameter. One of the many things we've yet to fully understand about our satellite is the unusual flashes of light that can sometimes be seen on its surface. Scientists have named these outbursts transient lunar phenomena, or TLP in short, and they have been seen all over the world for centuries. One of the first instances of TLP dates back to 1178, when monks from Canterbury claimed to have seen a flaming torch on the surface of the moon after the sun had set. TLP does not simply mean light flashes. Reports also have detailed other unusual events, such as gas-like mists, reddish, green, blue, or violet colorations, or even the darkening of certain locations on the moon. Is something strange happening with our moon? Is it the beginning or did we just start noticing it with the newer space study equipment we have nowadays? There are a lot of different theories that scientists have developed trying to piece together what can be causing these events. The unusual flashes on the moon can be caused by anything from meteoric impacts to electrostatic activity. It's difficult to pinpoint the explanation for each event since most of these episodes are recalled either by a single observer on Earth or from a single location. The fact that there is noticeable seismic activity on the moon can also explain why we can sometimes see unusual flashes of light on the surface of our satellite. When the moon's surface moves, it can cause different light-reflecting gases to erupt, which can explain luminous developments. Some scientists have even suggested that residual geologic activity may also be the cause. This is all the more shocking given that we've always looked at the moon as a lifeless world. Did you ever notice that our moon can change its color? There are actually many scientific explanations for that. The moon appears to be a brown tinted gray when you look upon it from outside of the Earth's atmosphere. When gazed upon from the Earth's surface, the moon appears to change color depending on various phenomena. The moon seen near the horizon will most likely be yellow or red tinted. The rarer blue colored moon indicates that you're looking at our satellite through an atmosphere carrying larger dust particles. The moon can even appear purple at times, but what causes this specific hue is still up for debate. The fact that we don't know exactly if or how much water there is on the moon's surface is not the main reason why we aren't already building houses up there. It seems that radiation actually has a lot more to do with it. Recent studies have shown that the moon's surface has a radiation rate 5 to 10 times higher than that you experience on a transatlantic passenger flight. That also means it's 200 times higher than the rate on the Earth's surface. In future lunar explorations, like the Artemis project for example, 
Scientists need to take this into consideration, not to expose the astronauts. Named after Artemis, Apollo's sister, this program aims not only to place astronauts on the lunar surface in the future, but also to build some sort of an establishment there to study the moon in safe conditions. While the project started in 2017, the first planned mission is set for launch in summer 2022, with an estimated duration of 25 days. The space object with no crew on board is planned to reach lunar orbit and safely return with sufficient data for the next four-person mission scheduled for May 2024. Artemis 3, 4, and 5 are expected to be launched in 2025, 2026, and 2027 respectively, each with a planned duration of approximately 30 days.